It was another scandal for Disney. Only now Disney has some, somehow or another lost its ability to shed scandals with ease. Uh, Disney is just dying on the vine, and it couldn't happen to a better group of people. It really couldn't. Uh, I, I, I wish them to receive all of the things and the seeds that they have planted. Um, you know, they used to be, they used to be the, the company that would bring joy and magic, and now it's black magic and, you know, just a, some corporate empire uh, that, you know, will do anything for a buck. And now they believe that they are the guardians of culture and they're going to change our culture. Their latest example is Wish. It's a movie that um, suppose, supposedly is to serve as the celebration of the 100th year of Disney magic. It is hacky and uninspiring um, and n- really not worth your time. And everybody knows that. Nobody's going to see it. Um, we, have, uh, we have an inside look now at what is, what is happening at Disney and can they ever bring it back. Film Threat, the founder and publisher of Film Threat, Chris Gore, is uh, with us now. Hi, Chris. How are you? Hey, doing great, Glenn. Thanks for having me on the show. So, first of all, tell people about Film Threat. So I'm not sure they know about it. Well, it's uh, uh, an independent film journal. We've been, uh, we were a magazine in the 80s and 90s. Now it's a website mm-hmm. and a podcast. And um, we've remained, oddly enough, politically agnostic through all of these How times. How did you I do mean, that? I, well, first of all, I don't know why any, uh, all the entertainment media outlets should actually be this. But um, yes. it's very bizarre. It, it, I mean, I feel obligated if a movie comes out and is an independent film. It's from one side of the aisle or the other. We will cover it. But that's not true for all of my colleagues. Um, in the industry who cover who cover film it's unfortunate i mean you did matt walsh's what is a woman and it was actually objective and i didn't i just assumed that would never happen in today's world never yeah well i think it's an important documentary and i think it's worthy of coverage and i don't know why it wasn't covered by by every media outlet i think it's it's an important conversation but you know we'll also cover documentaries about drag queens so um, sure. We're, we're all over the place. And I, and I think that that's our obligation. You know, we, we also, you know, we also reviewed Candace Owens documentary about BLM, uh, which did not get mm-hmm. a very favorable review. So um, but we look at everything and I, we try to be objective. And I, you know, I, I would like to see more of that. Um, Chris, I am the biggest Disney fan. I mean, I have the original prospectus hand colored by Walt Disney. I, I have been a fan since I was a kid. Uh, I have always been a champion for Disney. I have never seen a con- a company tube their credibility faster than the Disney Corporation. And I have gone from a fan to somebody can't wait to see them burn themselves out of existence. It, it's it's a remarkable thing that's happening with Disney. Well, it's, it is pretty crazy to watch in real time how they've taken one of yeah. the greatest brands, one of the greatest brands, um, a family brand. And I think it really has to do with getting away from their core values. When I talk about those values, I'm talking about the values of Walt Disney, Walt Disney, the man, right. the company. Walt Disney right. was a proud American who, who espoused family values through his art. And when you see where the company is now, it's become very corporate, um, filled with middle management bloat, micromanaging all of their artists. And as I like to say, I think corporate culture kills creativity. And that's where yeah. we're at. There's, there's more to this story. So- um, there's a lot more to this story, actually. You have uh, you have an article coming out where you've talked to many of the insiders who are giving you a real deep look into what what the culture is there. And there's one story about when everybody came back from work uh, after COVID, and they were having a meeting about which breakfast cereals uh, to put into the break room, and what happened. Well, it's a funny story. This was on a Zoom call. 
You were coming back from COVID and restocking the break room with cereals, which devolved into a conversation about privilege. And if you ate certain breakfast cereals when you were a kid, you were privileged. But if you ate generic breakfast cereals, you know, that, that said something about your upbringing and status. There seems to be a bizarre obsession with um, with all of this nonsense, identity, um, uh, you know, privilege, and and the fact that a simple conversation about restocking the breakfast cereal in the break room devolved into that shows you how bad the rot is. It's at every level, and the key word that has come up, I'll just say this: this article we have coming up on the FilmThreat.com website which is being uh, written by my colleague, Alan Ng. Um, it's, we've, we're currently talking to about a dozen current and former employees of at Disney and also people who work in animation. We're calling the series of stories the Disney Files, but the stories we're hearing are fairly shocking. So, um, but also like, might not be like shocking who? for anyone that's been paying attention. Not very shocking. Like what? Well, ultimately, uh, well, there's, there's more specifics to it, but ultimately all of the veteran talent has been driven from the company. Starting with John Lasseter. And his departure is not as described in the media. There was much more to it. I believe uh, that certain people felt threatened by John Lasseter, probably because he was the most talented person at the company, nearly every Pixar film was a home run. I mean, even the lesser mm -hmm. Pixar films, even the lesser Pixar films, when you look at what Disney's putting out today, um, they're amazing. So that, that's, that was the beginning of The Rock, was his departure. And that veteran, veteran talent has not been replaced by veteran talent. It's been replaced by, and I'm using words that, are in the correspondences, a key word came up in every correspondence with every person, and that is activism. The Ugh. people that have been replaced, they've been replaced by activists. And it's at all levels. You can't necessarily blame upper management. The rot is from right. the bottom up. So somebody described to me, and they said, Glenn, Bob Iger, nobody else can, nobody can fix this now. Because they felt that Bob Iger was responsible for a lot of this, but um, they said they hired activists and allowed them at the bottom to uh, just infest the Disney culture, if you will, and then it just kept growing stronger and stronger. And now there's really nobody left to hand the company and say, okay, all you guys, shut up, get out of here. You can't do it anymore. Do you believe that's true? Uh, I believe that is 100% true. 100%. And I, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's just a company culture that's been created. And those that don't agree with the direction of the company um, have to remain silent and are reprimanded even for espousing certain ideas. Um, at the HR department at Disney appears to work in an oppressive manner, creating a toxic work environment where if you we're talking about innocuous posts on Facebook from years ago and employees being dragged into HR into HR to have meetings at ungodly hours, you know, 6 a.m. or something to with an attorney sitting next to the HR person to discuss a social media post. There, there is a fall in line attitude, and if you don't fall in line, you're not welcome at Disney, which has got... led to. Go ahead. Sorry, which has led to ma many, which has led to many of these people leaving of their own accord. They're simply not welcome to think certain things and work for Disney. Well, you're not. I mean, I know creative people, and there's nothing that drives creative people more crazy. I mean, Walt would lose people from time to time because his management style was keep them always guessing, you know, and it'll make them sharper. The the animators hated that, but Walt was so good at what he did that you're either in Disney or you're not. 
now that's not the case. You're no creative person is going to um, uh, want to go to work every day, let alone be creative at work every day. If you're constantly looking over your DEI shoulder. Well, that's 100% true. Um, and on that note, interestingly enough, um, you know, lecturers come into Disney often to help animators and discuss topics like the, um, how a giraffe runs. What does it look like when it runs? How do birds right. fly? Different types of birds. They have brought in DEI lecturers to talk to all of the animators. And um, in our article, we're going to discuss uh, the person who's been coming in to speak at the, with the animators because um, not only was this DEI person saying that based on your identity, you are innately, you are racist based on the way you look. You are just a racist person. Um, this DEI uh, instructor, instructor lecturer went on to critique all of the Disney movies and why they're racist and why in particular a film called The Princess and the Frog was racist, which features a black princess. Oh, my gosh. That was <laughs> that was to expose, to bring in African-Americans and to expose people to a different culture. That's what that whole movie was uh, designed to do. Well, yes, absolutely. Uh, but this lecturer pointed out that because the, the princess in the film was turned into a frog, and was remained a frog for most of the movie that that was racist. And basically this lecture was telling the animators everything they're doing wrong, which erupted into a huge argument uh, with some of the animators who stood up. But this is the problem. This is the big problem is this is well known throughout the animation industry that Disney acts in this way. There are other companies, for example, illumination, um, you know, distributed by Universal, their animated films. They've avoided any sort of political messaging. Um, they make movies that are entertaining, the Minions movies, the uh, Super Mario movie, which crossed the billion-dollar right. mark. Um, they just, they're just making family entertainment, and they're well aware of that. Disney is the exception in this, where the messaging is a huge part of it, but this is well known in the industry. And it's, it's a whis It's become a whisper network where animators that have felt so betrayed that Disney's the Walt Disney company's legacy is, you know, is being, is falling by the wayside that they speak on private message groups between each other about everything that's going on. But here's the deal. If, if people at the Disney company don't speak out, there won't be a company left to save. It's, it's dire. When you look at the amount of money that they've lost this year, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. When you look at in, in the year 2019, Disney had seven movies that crossed the billion dollar mark. Uh, this year it's zero. It's unbelievable. So, it is the fastest. The, it's the fastest destruction of the greatest brand ever of the twentieth uh, uh, of the twentieth century. And you're right. I'm not sure if it's going to make it. Chris, I, I've got to cut you short, but I, I I apologize for that. I'd love to have you on right. when the story comes out uh, and spend some real time with you because I think this is it's fascinating to see the price that they're paying. Um, Chris Gore, the name of the website is filmthreat.com, filmthreat.com.